information, working on research, but she doesn't do this independently. She's doing it in conjunction with her husband, and she's really working on his projects. Carmen de Burgos, who wrote numerous feminist novels and novelettes, gained early fame as a feminist for her book on divorce, published in 1904. It was pretty scandalous at the time that it came out. She herself was unhappily married to a drunken, philandering husband, but she couldn't divorce him. Uh, but she did leave him. Uh, extremely bold move. She left this small Andalusian town where she lived with her husband, and she moved to Madrid with her daughter, and she began a career. She studied to be able to be a teacher. She became a teacher, and she became a journalist. And she wrote all kinds of things. She wrote columns for newspapers. She wrote cookbooks. Uh, I don't know if Maria uh, de la Paz is uh, including <laughs> Carmen de Burgos in her book, but uh, I'll be to, uh, I can't remember her uh, She wrote self-help books on beauty, uh, and uh, she wrote anything that would sell uh, so that she could make a living and uh, live on her own. And she wrote, as I say, many, many of these, uh, what we call kiosk novels, uh, dying novelettes, um, here's a, a portada, here's a, another one. Many of these dime novelettes that were written in a, a style that if you had a rud rudimentary ability to read, you could, you could read these. And so they were really quite uh, accessible both in terms of the language and in terms of the economics. And many of them had feminist mess messages. They, <clears throat> were novels about problems in, in marriage, about uh, having children out of wedlock, about the laws uh, that, uh, uh, unequal laws uh, involving uh, all kinds of aspects of, of women's lives. And I'm just going to tell you about one of them. I unfortunately don't have the cover of, of that one. Uh, so we'll just have to look at, at La Rampa. But the one I'm going to tell you about is titled El Artículo 438. And it concerns a law that stipulates that a husband who kills an adulterous wife can be condemned to exile. But if he beats her, there's no penalty at all. And this was, this was the law. <laughs> So in the novel, uh, a man uh, marries a woman, a wealthy woman, he marries her for her money, and then he encourages her to have an affair with a friend of his. And he does this by leaving them alone all the time, he ignores the wife, and of course uh, what he hoped would happen happens, and they have an affair, and he kills the wife. He gets off scot-free. And the man who had entered into the fair is, is imprisoned. And it's this kind of novel that began raising consciousness about the situation, the legal situation, the unequal legislation uh, concerning the land of women in Spain. And in 1931, under the Republic, the 1931 Republican Constitution gives absolute legal equality to both men and women. It gives women the right, not the right to vote, that, that, that came, uh, no, I'm sorry, the right to vote is included in the Constitution. It's the right to divorce that came a year later, uh, the right to work, absolute equality in the workplace. Uh, and so uh, this document completely reverses all of those uh, all of those measures that I indicated to you at the beginning of my talk. It says, and it employs the word person, not hombre. We finally made a huge step here. It, it says, toda persona es libre de elegir profesión. Todos los españoles sin distinción de sexo son admisibles a los empleos y cargos públicos según su mérito y capacidad. 
Unfortunately, in 1939, when the nationalist uh, forces won the Spanish Civil War under the leadership of the dictator of um, Pisco Franco, all of these gains that women made under the Republic were erased overnight. All of this pro progressive legislation that allowed divorce, uh, women's equal rights to work, total legal parity, uh, were abolished and the old civil code was put back into place. Women were once, uh, once again uh, the legal appendages of men. Uh, the division of the sexes was uh, absolute and it was even enhanced over the prior conditions by the sección femenina of the Falange party. Uh, the, uh, any woman uh, under the Franco regime who wanted to study, to work, to travel, had to complete many months of classes uh, that were given by the Seccion Femenina, mostly on sewing, cooking, and how to be a good wife to your husband. Smiling, 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 <laughs> no matter what. Uh, Carmen Martin Gaite, describes uh, the, um, in, in a wonderful book that I hope you can all look at sometime, Usos Amorosos de la Postguerra Española, describes uh, what this education in the Sección Femenina was like. El hombre era un núcleo permanente de referencias abstractas para aquellas ejemplares penélopes condenadas a coser, a callar y a esperar. Coser esperando que apareciera un novio llovido del cielo. Coser luego si había aparecido para entretener la espera de la boda, mientras él se labraba un porvenir o preparaba unas oposiciones. Coser, por último, cuando ya había pasado de novio a marido, esperando con la más dulce sonrisa de disculpa su tardanza, la vuelta de él a casa. Tres etapas unidas por el mismo hilo de recogimiento, de paciencia y de sumisión. Tal era el magnífico destino de la mujer bajo el régimen franquista. This situation made it impossible for women to write the kinds of overt feminist essays and novels that María Martínez Sierra, Carmen de Burgos, and many other women and men did in the first decades of the 20th century. Censorship was very strict, and the Franco government did not favor publications that depicted women as strong and independent. The genre that flourished in the 1940s and 1950s was the novela rosa, or what we call today harlequin romances, in which boy meets girl, then there's some complications, and then finally the complications are resolved and they get married. Uh, this was the kind of novel that, uh, that was uh, promoted and, and popular in, uh, in the early Franco era. Uh, and of course, this novel promoted the, the domestic woman, the woman who's looking to get married and, uh, and do uh, the household chores that the Franco regime envisioned. And in fact, many of these novels were written uh, by women who uh, belonged to the Falange Party or who subscribed to its goals for women. But some women found subtle ways to get around this prohibition against writing about feminist themes and from a feminist point of view. Uh, Carmen Laforet was a real pioneer in this way. And in fact, not only was she a pioneer in her writing, she was a pioneer in her physical presence. And Carmen Martín Gaite talks about this uh, also in, uh, in El Puerto de Atras. The fact that most women in the Franco era were very concentrated on getting their hair done at the beauty parlor and setting their hair in these curlers every night so they looked good when the husband came home late and so on and so forth. But Carmen Laforet was in her own physical presence a feminist figure because she did not curl her hair. She just, <laughs> it just was flying in the wind. And Carmen Martin Gaite really admired <laughs> that there was this woman who didn't worry about how she looked. In her novels, uh, she